Good morning, everybody out there, and thanks for joining us. I know we're at a special time today, but that's because we have a special program for you here on Zeiss Conversations. We thought, you know, it's it's a little bit of a special birthday time for us. Oh, I don't know. Maybe our founder was born this week. Um, so we'd like to celebrate that anniversary, and we'd like to share some of that history with you um, as well. So we were joined by a very special guest today. Please meet Dr. Wolfgang Wimmer, the head of archives for Carl Zeiss, the entire company. Um, if there's a question out there you need answered, he's the guy. He's the guy with all the knowledge. So um, we're w very happy to have him here. And welcome, Dr. Wimmer. I'm happy to have you join our group. Hello. <laughs> Good morning, or afternoon, I should say. Dr. Wimmer is actually coming to us straight from Germany, um, so he's, it's his afternoon today, so we're having a, a, a nice little conversation. Dr. Wimmer, um, I wanted to bring you and introduce you to the group. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to, to um, studying history and came to Carl Zeiss and, and, and how you got to where you are with the company. Yeah, thank you, and hello, everybody. Everybody, I, for me, it was very clear to study history when I was 16 years old. I was very interested in history. Uh, also, the, the difficult parts of German history interested me very much. So I started studying history in Munich uh, in, uh, in the 1980s. And I studied uh, modern history, 19th and 20th century and political sciences and philosophy. And after two years, I changed from Bavaria to the uh, Prussian center to Berlin, West Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days, uh, in the 1980s, uh, Berlin was divided, East Berlin and West Berlin. And I lived, of course, in West Berlin in, uh, and studied at the Free, Free University. And there, my interest changed uh, slowly to economic history and especially the history of industry. Uh, main interest is the, uh, the research, you start beginning of the research based industries like pharmaceutical industry. I wrote a doctoral thesis about, uh, about, the, about the development of the German pharmaceutical industry in the 19th and early 20th century. Wow. Okay. Now, af and afterwards, I, I made an uh, education as a scientific archivist. <laughs> Such a thing exists only in Germany, pro probably. <laughs> scientific archivist in the uh, country's archive of Berlin. It's also the city archive of Berlin. Uh, and uh, when I ended this education, the job here in Jena as head of the Carl Zeiss uh, uh, archives uh, was uh, free and, and I changed to Jena and now I'm almost for 25 years <laughs> now here. Wow. Uh, and um, uh, we will talk about the archive and what we do every day later, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so. Wonderful. And I realize that uh, many of you have not joined our stream before. And so who you're seeing on your left and your right are two of our photo ambassadors. On your left is our Zeiss ambassador, Tracy Page. She is an Otis shooter, um, uses the, the Zeiss Otis lenses, uh, does a lot of uh, um, um, portrait photography and headshots um, in the film community, actually. Um, and on our right is Zeiss ambassador Kenneth Hines, a Sony shooter um, shooting with Loxia currently. Um, but uh, kind of moves around. He's he runs the gamut of the Zeiss lenses. He's joining us today from far out in in the Midwest somewhere. He's on a tour shooting some landscape for us. So they are our usual hosts, and they'll also be joining in on the conversation. We have Dr. Vimmer. We have lots of questions for you, um, and certainly we want to talk about um, uh, about Carl Zeiss uh, because he's the man of the hour today. His 204th birthday is this week. And I wonder if you want, might want to take us through um, a little conversation about his history and, and um, the founding of, of Zeiss. Yes. Yes. So I'll tell something about uh, his life mm -hmm. and how he founded the company and how it grew in the first years. So we start with the second uh, slide. Yep. Uh, Carl Zeiss was born in Weimar on uh, September 11th, 1816. In those days, uh, Goethe, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the most famous German 
writer, poet, and a politician in those days still lived in Weimar. And Weimar is a very small city. Uh, still today, it's very small, but it, nevertheless, it's a cultural center of, of Germany uh, in those days and also today. And um, a very special story is that um, that uh, Karl's father uh, was um, Artwood Turner, and the Duke of Saxony, of the uh, Grand Duchy of Saxony, not the state of Saxony, it's a bit complicated. There are different regions uh, in Germany which uh, have the name Saxony. <laughs> but, and and uh, the, uh, in one of them, uh, Weimar is the capital and the Duke, he had a hobby as an art turner. Oh, wow. uh, and so the father of uh, Karl Zeiss um, helped him and, and made the finish of the works. And this is the reason why the Grand Duke was the, was the godfather of uh, Karl Zeiss. He has the same uh, name, Karl Friedrich. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. This is the reason. Uh, Karl Zeiss spent his youth in, uh, in, in Weimar. He visited the normal school and afterwards uh, grammar school. And we don't know very much about this early time. Uh, in 1832, he finished his studies. And what we know is that he uh, was already interested in technology. He made some extra courses in, in technological uh, things. And in those days, uh, as uh, mechanics was the most interesting uh, uh, technical theme, not as today electronics or computing or something like that. Uh, it was um, or not computing computers. Uh, it was um, uh, mechanics. And uh, so he started an apprenticeship. Can make the next slide. Yep. Uh, in uh, Jena at the university, there was Friedrich Körner. He was his master and uh, Friedrich Körner also, there are some similarities in the bi biography of Karl Zeiss and Friedrich Körner. Friedrich Körner also made microscopes and he also tried to produce optical glass, but uh, his uh, early attempts had no success. And later on, we will see uh, Karl Zeiss uh, followed in these uh, attempts, and, but he was luckier. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, after, after this apprenticeship, uh, Karl Zeiss traveled through Germany. Austria was in those days uh, also part of, of Germany. He was in Vienna. Vienna was uh, one of the center of the optical industry in those days. Uh, also in St Stuttgart, Darmstadt and uh, in Berlin. Uh, this was his last station of his journey. It lasted, uh, this journey lasted seven years. It was usual for, uh, for craftsmen to, um, to make such a, a journey. I was going to mm -hmm. say that's, that's, that's moving a lot around the country um, for, yeah. for, for essentially his apprenticeship. Yes, the apprenticeship was finished and it was normal in most European countries to make such a tour uh, for making uh, external experiences, for le learning new, new things, uh -huh. to travel around. Some professions still make this today, uh, in, at least in Germany. It is not so, but, but not every kind of profession ma makes it, but for example, uh, wood, um, uh, uh, wood, wood, woodwork. Wood, people making woodwork make such things. You see, see them traveling around. Great. It is for, for, for exchanging experiences, for learning new, new things. And cities like Vienna and Berlin were really centers of, of, of craft and craft experience. Um, and uh, it's rather sure that he learned a lot in, in these towns. 
Excellent. Which is, is, you know, we think of artists doing that, traveling to Italy and the Netherlands, but to think that, that it was also happening in the scientific community puts him kind of in that realm of being an artist with what he was doing. Scientific uh, scientists also must travel where they get a job and at which university they have also such a traveling. Uh, there's also this kind of, uh, and, but it is also in, in crafts, uh, in, in, at least in Germany, uh, or I think in most European countries. Well, one thing that I find interesting is that in, as far as with Carl Zeiss and, and the development of the microscope, was he looking for something? Did he find that there was some kind of a, a something that was missing in that time? You know, a lot of inventors, a lot of creators, they're out to, to, to improve something that might already be there or develop something that we haven't even thought we need. Was he visioning that? Uh, of, of doing something that he saw there was room to improve on and why he decided to go that route? It's, uh, we, we, we also don't have many sources about uh, uh, the things he did and he thought in, the, in this time we have only one letter he wrote to um, one of his colleagues he, he had met in, in Vienna and uh, the name is Beck and he, this, this colleague was in Moscow then and, and they uh, had uh, some, some letters, exchanged some letters and that's the only information we have about this early time. So we do not know exactly what he was, uh, was planning. Uh, and of course, in, in Vienna and in Berlin, there were, were very uh, famous microscope producers, but the companies he worked did not produce uh, microscopes. So uh, probably he, in this time, he did not, not already know that microscopes would be the big, his big theme, probably. Yes, uh, and then he came back to Jena in 1845. And there uh, he had also, when in his apprenticeship, he had visited some lectures at the university in mathematics, optics, also in mechanics and things like that. And then he studied uh, chemistry and biology in an institute, a new institute. Um, and there was a professor um, who, um, uh, who had uh, done some research on cells and for cell studying microscopes were very important. This professor was Matthias Schleiden. He was uh, one of the founders of the cell theory. That means that all life is based on cells, not only of plants, but also of animals and also of human, uh, human uh, beings. And this Professor Schleiden, he was probably the man to focus cult size on microscopes because uh, microscopes were an important research instrument. And um, yes, the next slide then, um, this that's, is that's, probably, yeah. That's, that's awesome. I, I mean, I hadn't thought about the fact that the scientific background of studying the biology and the chemistry actually led him to the need for improving the optics. Right. Yes. Yes, um, the, uh, Schleiden uh, had a very good overview about the microscopes that were produced in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the first stands, the first microscopes, Carl Zeiss built were not so far from, from these uh, that already existed. And probably uh, Schleiden led his way uh, to, to not only to the theme microscopy, but also uh, showing him what what is good and what is not so good. Uh, uh, Schleiden was very uh, distinctive. He said, "This is good, and this is not so good." <laughs> also, in his uh, uh, he, he said, uh, for example, he wrote that uh, most uh, producers do a lot of things to the microscopes which are not necessary, please leave them away. So uh, probably he, he led the way the early day, early beginnings of Carl Zeiss in this microscopy direction. Yeah, so Carl Zeiss opened a workshop in November, 1846 in Jena. Uh, he, he changed uh, 
after only a half a year. So I think the first office was not really a, a workshop. It was just a place <laughs> to make first studies. And then in 1847, in his new workshop, he started beginning uh, started producing simple microscopes. Simple microscopes means that they were um, they had no complex optics, but only single lenses. It is more like um, like a, a, a glass for it's, it's for like a one element. Um, uh, yes. almost like you would have a like a, 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 a magnifying, magnifying glass. glass. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yes. And then Carl Zeiss employed August Löber. He was an um, important person for, for this uh, workshop. All the op optic opticians, he educated all the opticians who worked for Carl Zeiss. And uh, when Carl Zeiss grew uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, when the company grew, uh, then these apprentices, which were educated by August Löber, all became the important craftsmen, the, the heads of, of the different departments of, of pr for producing the optics. So the August Lüber, the first uh, guy he uh, employed was also very important for the company. And the next slide, mm -hmm. uh, Carl Zeiss had always thought about building complex compound microscopes with complex optics. Uh, that means with an objective and with uh, eyepieces. But um, he, uh, he, um, he thought that uh, these uh, optics um, were not produced on, uh, on uh, calculations on a basis of calculations, oh. but they were, were um, composed more, um, not, not on a scientific basis, but over on a practical. Haphazardly? Yeah, Haphazardly? Haphazardly, yes. Yeah, so, not put together yeah. with a scientific formula, but yes. just more because they felt like it would work. <laughs> they combined different lenses so long until the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, lens worked, they had not the, the objective work. They just took one after the other until it fit together. It was not trial, uh, and error, yeah. trial and error, that's the point, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, yes, and I didn't like this. Uh, <laughs> and this was <laughs> the reason why it, uh, it lasted more than 10 years that he, he made his first attempt uh, on compound microscopes. But uh, these microscopes were successful from the very beginning. And so in the 1860s, Carl Zeiss, we can say Carl Zeiss was a successful uh, entrepreneur. Uh, he was a citizen of the small city of Jena. He had also some political functions. Uh, he was for some time member of the of the city council. And so he was a successful uh, entrepreneur in the midst of the 1860s. And this could be the end of the story, <laughs> but uh, uh, it was not the end of a story. It was the beginning of another story. And uh, this is connected closely with the name Ernst Abbe. That's the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Ernst Abbe, uh, was the son of a of a of a worker. Um, he came from very uh, easy. Uh, he was not bourgeois, or his background was more from a from a labor labor oh, okay. family. Proletariat. Proletarian family, more or less. But uh, the, he was uh, very talented and some teachers and also the boss of his father saw this and they uh, helped him to, to make the, make the uh, a good uh, education first in the school in Eisenach where he was born. And then he was able to study in Jena. 
and uh, he studied physics and mathematics. And then he changed to Göttingen, Göttingen, which was a very famous university in those days, one of the most important German universities. And um, from there, he wrote his doctoral thesis, and then he returned to Jena. And uh, it was clear that he had the chance uh, to get a, a, prof a professorship uh, in at the University of Jena, oh, wow. but it last lasted some years. <laughs> it was in, in the same in Germany. It is uh, all uh, today. It, it uh, lasts some years until you get such a job. It's not not so easy for him. Uh, it lasted uh, almost uh, seven years, and in this time. He had not much money. He had to live from the, the, the money the students paid for each lecture. Uh, this, so he was not able to, to finance a family or something or ch children. Or, or, uh, so um, the, the co cooperation, collaboration with uh, Carl Zeiss brought in also some income. And what is very typical for Ernst Appe is that he not only tried to solve the problem, but that he tried to find a, a very principled solution, a mathematical or very theoretical solution. So it not only brought a solution to the problem of these lenses I described before with your help, uh, but also this was a method for other optical themes to approach. As, and, and this is for the, for the next decades, uh, it was what he did and what his uh, pupils did was this physical fundamental physical point of view bringing to different themes. And, and this is the basis of a lot of uh, innovations. And I think this is, yeah. I was going to say this is the really fascinating part for me because what, what you're saying is that before Ernst put pen to paper, they, there really wasn't the concept of, of, a, of a mathematical or an engineering construct behind op optics. It was really just trial and error to that point? There was um, an, an attempt 50 years before. Uh -huh. It was Fraunhofer. Maybe also I'm I'm not so uh, maybe so there were also some British or French or American mm -hmm. uh, scientists but, but but I don't know them and I should know them because <laughs> okay. but, but if, if we're, somebody we're, has we're, other stories just tell tell, tell me yes. Uh, no, we're not holding you to knowing who they are. <laughs> yeah, Fraunhofer also tried such a theoretical, mathematical approach, but he died very early. Oh. And the pro and the theme was that that um, they kept everything secret. And when uh, Fraunhofer died, also the experience, uh, no, nobody had to know how anymore. He had also a very similar story. He also tried, he, he built some optical instruments, especially mm -hmm. astronomical instruments, but also microscope. And he also tried to melt new classes, new oh. kinds of optical classes, both things. Um, but uh, um, Fraunhofer died very early. And uh, and so his company continued, but the, but not with such a uh, success anymore. And this is uh, Ernst Appe himself felt uh, as a successor of Fraunhofer, and he tried to learn from his mistakes. So uh, he did not keep the things secret. In microscopy, he even didn't take patents. Uh, he. Oh, wow published everything because he thought it's good for the scientific uh, progress of uh, not he didn't want the information to die with him he wanted right. it to yeah. to be larger than yes. he was and that's really interesting too because that's that's you know it's the difference between it almost it sounds almost as if he was the father of of uh, of open source you know which we which we use in software today Yes, it's uh, it's its idea is also in the in the statute of the Carl Zeiss uh, uh, Foundation. We mm -hmm. will speak afterwards. There is that the patents should only be taken in very special cases, and they should not uh, block 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 blockade. Uh, uh, 
the progress. Awesome. So should not hinder the pro progress. Should not. Um, hinder is a great word. Should not yes, stand in the way of progress. It sounds so German yeah. to me. <laughs> <You know>? I, <laughs> <laughs> I know. The translations to our, our southern colloquialisms, too, make it even worse. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. No, I, I, I think that's fantastic that, the, that Zeiss as a company doesn't wants to share um, the innovation. Um, and I, I, that's, that's just fantastic to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and uh, he, so uh, uh, Jans Abe formulated a theory of formation of the uh, image in the microscope, uh, and it, it, he himself didn't publish so many, but he had a, a co colleague, um, Siegfried Chapsky, who published most of, of, the, of, the, of the research of, of Ernst Abe. From 1870 and until 1896, uh, Abe also was professor of physics at the University of Jena. And uh, from there, there were a lot of, of uh, students changed to the company and were later on were the scientific staff of, the, of Carl Zeiss. In 1876, uh, Carl Zeiss uh, um, offered Abe a partnership in the company because um, he was afraid that Abe would uh, would be interested more in academics, and and so he made a, a partnership. Uh, and Abe uh, received uh, half of the company. And therefore, uh, the uh, academic academic um, uh, engagement of, of Abe was limited. And uh, some years later, only a two or three years, years later, Abe received um, uh, a call call for uh, the University of Berlin. Mm -hmm. This in those days was the most uh, uh, was the, the most interesting Prestigious. place to. <laughs> Still is uh, again, yes, <laughs> and and for physics, uh, also for natural sciences in those days, it was a very interesting location. But uh, Abe couldn't change from Jena to to Berlin because of this partnership in the company. So uh, uh, and Carl Zeiss had had a good uh, nose. He he had seen that that uh, that there is a danger for, for the company. Uh, and in 1889, Ernst Abbe uh, created the Carl Zeiss Foundation. We will talk afterwards about this. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, in, in, yeah. yeah, I was just going to say this is this is the other great thing you you had mentioned uh, the the, uh, the the gentleman 50 years before um, dabbling with changing some of the the, the glass construction. But um, but that's I, sorry, I'm prefacing your conversation. I just I, I'm excited to learn more about um, about how all these came together. Yeah, especially with auto shot too. <laughs> yes, um, in the Early 1870s, um, the, the microscope lenses were produced on basis of the calculations of Ernst Abe. But he said the glass that uh, could be bought from glass producers was more or less only the win normal window glass. So the possibilities to change the the um, the the different the the glass the the break uh, the, breaking the tensile yeah. strength or the the, yeah. the the chemical makeup of it yeah, and the uh, the optical um, the optical uh, transmission transmission for example or the the, bre uh, the how the light, the uh, the breaking uh, the, all these optical um, uh, qualifications, all the optical um, the the eigenschaftness, quality? the term yeah, yeah. qualities could not be changed. The opt it was just always the same kind of glass. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Abbe wrote, we dream, we, we had a dream and, and calculated uh, 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 lenses with optical, um, optical, uh, 
eigen, Eigenschaft, all the same word, uh, optical characterizations. Uh, 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 but we didn't have this class. So uh, in 1879, a letter uh, 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 arrived in Jena, uh, Otto Schott, uh, the son of a glass producer, uh, had made some experiments with uh, different optical, uh, with different glasses, sorts of glasses, and uh, and this was of course uh, Abe at once knew that this would be a very very fundamental cooperation between these two. So uh, they started a long series of, of uh, experiments uh, with different um, with uh, different uh, uh, different types uh, of glass, or yeah. yes, and and uh, Schott produced this glass, and uh, uh, Abe and his uh, scientists they um, tried it whether it was. Uh, Good for optical for optical constructions or not. So uh, I, I imagine, yeah, that that, that Ernst and Otto, or uh, with everybody working together, the consistency of the glass was, was going to speed up the the ability of their production. Um, you know, to if there's an accuracy to what you're putting together, you can start to 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 make it more consistently and have a better product. Yes, also the compounds of the class uh, are very important. And uh, Schott made an experiment with uh, different combinations of, of materials for producing this class. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a really systematic approach also to new kinds of, of optical glass. It was also a, a scientific approach and it was successful after, after uh, about two years, they had a very good mm -hmm. optical glass, and uh, it was also um, it, it, it had not all, all only the optical qualities are important, but also that it, it is stable, that it does not uh, change with the weather and and uh, air uh, and things like that. And so uh, say they founded in 1884 uh, the Glass Technisches Laboratorium. Uh, which produced these optical glasses. Uh, but everybody knew that optical glass is, is needed only in very small quantities. Uh, even if all uh, instrument makers all over the world would uh, buy the glass from shot, uh, this would only be a very, very small uh, business. So the most important business for uh, uh, Otto Schott and his company in the first years was uh, a thermally resistant borosilicate glass. It is for, 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 you can use it for cooking and in, at least in Germany, it was famous for baby uh, bottles for <laughs> warm, you can make them warm and the glass does not uh, explode. Normal glass, if you make it warm, would explode, but this porosilicate glass did not. Okay, so uh, the shot company developed to an independent company. Uh, it is today still also owned by the Carl Zeiss Foundation. Uh, we will learn more about the Carl Zeiss Foundation right. later. So the company uh, was located in almost in, in Jena and of course, uh, it started in in the 1890s with uh, with binoculars, and uh, then it produced also other um, optics, which was had also some uh, military uh, uh, meaning Application, yeah. applications. Uh, so in the first world war and also in the second world war, Carl uh, Zeiss was an important. Uh, uh, company producing such military optics in Germany. Uh, in 1945, Jena was not conquered by the Russian troops first, but the American troops were here first. And uh, they thought whether um, to, to, to transfer 
parts of the company uh, to the west to, to their um, occupation zones, or uh, but but the time was too too short, and so they decided to take uh, 77 members uh, of the company, scientists, uh, almost scientists and engineers, uh, to the west, and they these 77 persons founded the company Opten Optische Werke Oberkochen in West Germany, in the southwest of Germany. So Jena was in the east and later on in the Russian zone. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, Optische Oberkochen was in the American zone. And so uh, after the Iron Curtain fell, uh, and divided the country, also the company was divided. And in the first time they cooperated, but in 1953, um, the conflict between East and West uh, escalated and uh, size and, and this cooperation was not possible anymore. Uh, yes. Um, an important part of, of Carl Zeiss, of the company, is in the next slide, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. was uh, Zeiss Econ. Zeiss Econ was founded in 1926 uh, from four different ca camera producers. So Zeiss Econ was one of the most important camera producers. Uh, and it was originally in Dresden, which was, was also part of the Russian zone, and in Stuttgart, uh, that's near Oberkochen. So uh, Zeiss Econ was also divided in two parts. And, um, but uh, in the 1960s, the uh, Japanese uh, camera producers uh, were very efficient and mm -hmm. within a few years, Zeiss Econ, which was really a, one of the leaders, one of the that very big market, uh, uh, but uh, they lost ground within five years. And so uh, Zeiss Econ in West was closed in the early 1970s. Since then, Zeiss does not produce cameras uh, only only single cameras, the Zeiss Econ camera, for example, uh, but but the, the, this was was were only a few cameras. So I, I, I didn't just... I didn't realize that we lost the Econ division in the seventies. I I thought it was more recent. That's that's kind of fascinating. Yes, there were some parts of Zeiss Econ which continued. Uh, for example, a, a, um, a company in Berlin producing keys for lockers. Uh, mm -hmm. It still exists. It has the name ZE today, today ZE, mm -hmm. ZI, ZI. Uh, <laughs> uh, it still exists, but the camera produce, uh, production was, uh, was ended in 1973 three or something. Or so you were, you were saying, and I'm just curious about this, you were saying that um, both Yena and, and I apologize what uh, people, what you're seeing on the screen is we had a little technical glitch here, so I have to adjust some of the windows live, so I have my apologies. Um, it, but, but you're saying that the, the, the Icon camera was was, create, was was manufactured both in the West and the East. Did um, did Yena and, and, and Oberkoken um, do dual um, manufacture? Did they work together after the after the curtain came down, or or how did that work out? After 1953, there was no uh, no cooperation anymore. There right. was a really conflict, and and there were competitors uh, from then. The oh. Dresden Zeiss camera, versus Zeiss. <laughs> yes, that's that's the point. Yes, uh, and uh, and um, the. Dresden uh, uh, company did not use the name Zeiss Econ anymore. They were not allowed to use this name. So they renamed themselves as Pentacon. Oh. And this Pentacon com uh, company existed until 1990. And after the unification, everybody said, oh, the Japanese camera industry is so strong. Uh, nobody wanted to give money to, to uh, bring Pentacon uh, to the international market. It was too um, too too risky, and therefore also Pentacon was closed in 1990. 
one, I think. Maybe okay. this is the story you mean when you say it was only a few years. It's also well, no, I just, I, I just, <laughs> yeah. I see, I see Zeiss Icon, you know, cameras for sale on and eBay. I just didn't realize that they weren't more current. I thought, you know, for some reason, I was thinking it had more to do with the switch from film to digital. I didn't realize that it happened in the 70s, way before film was, uh, digital was even on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So that it was really a matter of east-west uh, divisions and competitiveness. I, I just, it's fascinating to me to hear the real story. Yeah. Yes. Uh but this, there was a, in the 1990s, Zeiss uh, brought out a camera with the name Zeiss Econ. It, it was the brand name Zeiss Econ. Uh, yes, but it was only a single camera for, and for, for some years. Uh, so it had not so a, not such a big market share as, as uh, the Zeiss Econ, uh, original or Zeiss Econ cameras. Dr. Wimmer, I wonder if you, uh, if we, because we, we're, it's, I could listen to you talk all day, but uh, unfortunately we're, we're, we're running out of time. I wonder if you could skip ahead and talk about the different divisions of the company. Um, we, we have a, a, a photography uh, fan base here that, that, that comes and visits us, but they perhaps might, might get something out of knowing just what um, we do as a company um, outside of photography. Yeah, so we there's a slide about the different branches mm -hmm. of Carl Zeiss. The beginning, of course, was microscopy, 1846. And in the 1890s, Ernst Abe started um, a, a diversification strategy. Uh, this had to do with the optical glass. And there's also the story that um, that he, he did not want to to make uh, camera lenses, uh, mm -hmm. but the competitors, the producers of, ca of, of camera lenses, they still used the window glass. They didn't buy the glass from Otto Schott. And so uh, he wanted to show um, his comp the, the camera producers that what is possible with optical glass. And that this is the reason why Carl Zeiss started in the 1890s to produce, produce camera lenses first. Okay. Ooh, wow. uh, and also uh, binoculars, I mentioned it just before, were started in the 1890s, today Carl Zeiss Sport Optics, eyeglass lenses. Uh, Abe lived, uh, died in 1905. So this is not um, his theme there, Zeiss cooperated with uh, Gulp, uh, with uh, Alva Gullstrand. Mm -hmm. He was a Swedish Nobel Prize winner, and he uh, had done some principle, principle uh, theoretical about how the eye works. <laughs> the, 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 the turning point of the eye was a very important um, thing, and on this basis completely new lenses for uh, uh, for eyeglass were, were uh, calculated and produced. And also in the same year, year also in co cooperation with um, uh, Gullstrand, uh, medical devices, ex especially for uh, eye uh, uh, for investigations. Yeah, for optometry. Optometry, yeah. uh, or for a medical, yeah. um, for the medical, where in intro English, introduced I can't get that word right. Ophthalmo <laughs> ophthalmology. Ophthalmologist. There we go. Ophthalmologist. <laughs> yes. After the First World War, um, precision measuring was an important uh, theme, and uh, for, for for industry, especially standardization was was an important theme and those precision measuring was important. And in 1924, the first planetarium for for the Deutsche German Museum in Munich was constructed. And so uh, in 1968, the high performance optics for producing microchips, which is today the most important branch of cult size, uh, making the uh, biggest earnings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we all live more or less from them. It was founded 50 years ago. Wow. But okay. on the next uh, slide, you can see there are a lot of themes which actually do not uh, exist in the company anymore. There are a lot of other companies which are based 
also here in the Jena region, which are based on these technologies, and they exist, but they are not part of the of the company anymore. So measuring that's more or less chemical analytical measuring of, of chemicals, astronomical devices, big big uh, telescopes here in near Jena is a two meter telescope. Mm -hmm. It's not so, not uh, as big as the Mount Wilson telescope, as a five meter telescope, but two, two meters is also one of the big instruments and other. Uh, such telescopes were produced from size until the 1990s. Um, aerial photography, uh, Carl Zeiss produced or introduced most of the techniques for this, uh, for this uh, uh, industry, but it was uh, in the last 20 years, everything was digitalized uh, and these measuring machines are not needed anymore. So mm -hmm. this branch was completely closed. Military instruments, I mentioned it before, were produced also until two, two, uh, 2012. And then it was, the branch was sold. It is now the name Hensold, uh, which will go to the uh, stock market in the next weeks. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. very successful, but it's completely different. Uh, it's, it has no uh, stock uh, of, of this company anymore. Geodetic instruments, uh, but also things like headlights. And there would be a lot of, of different automobile china for, uh, for, for cars you see on the, on the top of this uh, slide. Uh, a lot of other things could be mentioned here uh, where size was active for some time, but this business doesn't, didn't, uh, do not exist anymore. And all because they had more optical glass than they needed to manufacture microscopes. All of these other things came about, which is kind of fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, yes, and of course the the business for microscope was limited, and and so an expansion of the company was only possible with new, with new branches with new uh, businesses. Well, the, Glad um, they did, or I wouldn't be shooting with that Otis today. Right. Well, it's mm -hmm. it's always so interesting that you know the 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 foundation from uh, you know from the beginnings of of trying to produce a more accurate and more consistent um, lens has really lended itself across different um, different avenues and different technologies. Um, I wanted to, to touch base, uh, Dr. Wimmer, on on how the company is organized and, and the, the foundation specifically, because that's that's a little that's a lot different than, than things that we have seen in the US. And I thought it might be interesting to touch on that for a little for a moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, as, as we have uh, spoken, a big theme for uh, Ernst Abbe was how could how the company could survive, not only him, but um, he had two daughters, daughters, they were not interested in, in uh, things like physics. Mm -hmm. And um, so he saw that a company is not only um, uh, investment, but it is also the people working there. Uh, and so he wanted uh, to strengthen the, the people uh, who work for its size. As mm -hmm. the two, two themes, one con continuation of the, of the company and the other is uh, the people working for the company. And uh, therefore, he founded the foundation, Carl Zeiss Foundation. In those days, foundations were not uh, not a, a standard form for companies. Um, so it was rather new. Or, or and and uh, also the statute he wrote uh, personally was uh, something very new in those days. And the special thing is not that. The eight-hour stay, for example, was earlier than in other companies, or that the wages were higher than in other companies, or the other things were faster or higher, or something like that. Uh, but these things were enforceable rights. The people could go to court and say, this is my right. And this was in the late 19th century in Germany, very unusual. Uh, the Working relations were more or less patr patrimonic. The 
boss said and the uh, and the worker had to do it mm -hmm. and and there was another concept not of of ordering so but of a, a concept of of uh, cooperation uh, and this uh, was rather new Mm -hmm. especially for big companies in Germany in the late 19th century. And this, I think this is the most important thing for with a size foundation. And um, yes, the problem was that uh, size and shot both were uh, not uh, independent, independent legal entities. So the, the, the banks and also international um, partners did not understand what is this, uh, who is responsible. Uh, so it was a very complicated and <coughs> for most people also a strange uh, construction. Uh, that this brought some problems and this is the reason why in 2004, that's the next slide, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, there was a reform of the statute. Uh, the main goals played of the foundation remained the same as before, uh, but the two companies are now um, uh, stock uh, Aktiengesellschaft in, in German, uh, they were stock based, yes. but the Zeiss Foundation is the only holder, they are the only holder of 100% of these stocks. So it is not on the stock market uh, and um, the, the, the crisis of 2009, everybody said that was a big uh, advantage because the company was not so, had no short time goals, the, but long time goals. Uh, and, and it was easier to, uh, to, um, to go through the crisis uh, than other stock-based companies because they also always have to pay some, some uh, interests uh, to their owners right. and the foundation they they if they get money they are content and if they not do not get uh, money then they must uh, um, they have no not so much money for social and or scientific projects but it is not is existential for them they st still survive can survive I think that's probably going to help um, in today's market as well as we as we weather this current crisis mm-hmm yeah, maybe we hope so. <laughs> yes, and uh, what what is very important also with this foundation is that it's the the science relation of the company to the science is uh, very uh, important. Uh, what the company does itself has something to do with uh, science and the money the foundation can spend on basis of the earnings of the companies. Um, is also mostly used for uh, scientific uh, projects and projects that had not, had, have nothing to do with science directly, most of them. It's really for, for progress of science is, uh, is, is the theme. So the company still fundamentally wants to support science and, and keep progressing scientifically. And I just, I, I think that that is fascinating. And I'm assuming that still believes in the open sharing of scientific information as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's all incredibly fascinating um, information. I, I, I wonder, um, as, as we move into the, the, this current time with Zeiss, um how how, how do you, how how do you continue to decide what will become important historically um to to add to the archive certainly there's a lot going back um but as we move forward and in your job how do you decide this is important and and this maybe we you know it it doesn't need to be or is all of the information gathered at this point Yes, of course. If we are in Germany, there's also a scientific theory about this, oh, <laughs> and the okay. theory is that the archive should represent the whole organization. That means also very boring uh, things like paying bills or something like that should be represented in a one form. Not all bills that are paid should be part of the uh, of the of the company mm -hmm. of the archives, but that was that one sees 
also such simple processes um, should be represented. And in fact, in the last 20 years, even such simple things changed dramatically. Today, they are done totally different than 20 years ago. So it, it is not bad to, to represent all these things in individuals. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, so uh, size is a, uh, the products uh, are for size most important things. Size, one can say, is product driven. Uh, so, and on, also the people asking us, uh, it's almost about products, uh, microscopes, lenses, and things like that. And so, uh, informations about products are also central for us. This is right. more ex the experience we have make every day answering questions, then we know. Uh, these uh, products will be important. And so we, we keep the records of, of products, also publications about products are important and pictures. Uh, what um, I have some colleagues uh, who, uh, who make projects mm -hmm. uh, to, to for, for photographs, that they, for, for pictures, they say we cannot cannot take all pictures into the archive. I think pictures they do not need so much space, and and also the internet-based <laughs> world uh, is, is searching pictures. So I right. don't throw any picture away. Yeah. Every picture is kept in the archive. Uh, so we have uh, the view of the microscope from from this perspective, from this, from every angle. Right. <laughs> we have uh, several thousand pictures only showing instruments, nothing else but only the instruments. But uh, nevertheless, I think uh, th these pictures uh, are very important for Absol the archive. Absolutely. You know, and there's well, always the philosophy of, you know, uh, do you, you know, is everything recorded now or, or do you choose to, to be selective? And I think the way that you're headed certainly is, is important to the company to make sure we document all aspects. Um, Dr. Vimmer, before we go, uh, there's a, been a, just a couple of questions in the live chat. Um, our friend Brandon, um, who I was telling you about, that's my lunch buddy from last week. Um, he, uh, he was asking with, with all of this focus on science, did, did, Carl and Ernst and Otto ever really did they did they did they realize that they were going to bring art into it? Did they focus on art as part of as part of the organization of the company? Uh, Otto Schott was very interested in art. He was a collector of antique uh, sculptures. Uh, he's a famous uh, um, from uh, uh, Carl Zeiss died before photographic uh, division was opened. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ernst Abbe, it's an interesting. <laughs> we just uh, are edit, uh, editing, editing the letters of uh, uh, Ernst Abbe and his wife to a friend, uh, to friends, and and his wife was very interested in culture. They went to the theater and things like that, and and. Uh, she writes that uh, Ernst Abbe also always was joking about it. He was very concentrated on on, on, on uh, natural science, on, on physics. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> but I don't uh, have any sources that show that he was really interested in art. <laughs> <laughs> so it really, but it, it led to a lot of interest in art. Oh, absolutely. Or at least the and use of the products there, yeah. We also have on with us, we have uh, Eileen Traval, who is the oh, cool. uh, photographic um, kind of archivist for the Met Museum in New York. So when you're talking about photographing everything for the archives from different angles, she does that of the art at the Met. So I think that those are very well related. And Mark Johnson, who is um, one of the photojournalism professors at the University of Georgia, has a great question. He's saying that Zeiss has been known for a lot of great lenses over the years, but is, is there one lens that you think is most more important to the company, to the development of, of what they do with lenses? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not such a big specialist on the history of photographic lenses and photographic cameras. I know something about the technique, <laughs> uh, but uh, for the company history, uh, economically, the Tissar lenses were the most important uh, lenses, of course. And technically, uh, and 
so the sonar lenses were of course very mm. important and since i i'm specialist for everything that's older than 20 years the last 20 years are always a problem i don't know what happened in the i know more about the uh, so i don't really, really don't know <laughs> anything about the actual lenses <laughs> not the not the current yeah. crop of lenses well, and that's, just that's, you know that, that that's interesting because it, it, it's it's because and we didn't touch on it but those those um, um, lens stack ups or lens combination designs the Tessar and the Sonar and Vistagon and Planar they they really are the foundation of of all of the all, all of the lensings that we make today um, and you can see that in in some of the classics as well as even the naming conventions have come through in the current families as well I wonder just just for my edification are those same um, designs are they utilized uh, in in other avenues like in the Meditech or in the um, in in the the, the um, microscopy um, equipment as well? Yes, uh, these uh, hist uh, lenses, Tissar lenses and Sonar lenses were also used for other uh, instruments. Mm -hmm. There was a, a lot of crossover. Uh, so crossover between the branches uh, in, in optics today, I think the, uh, the um, optics calculators, uh, they work for the different parts of the company and, and this is the basis how, how experience come from one part of the company to another. The, the optical designers, they, they, I think they know very good what what, what is needed in the different fields of, of optics. Wonderful, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, any, um, uh, Mr. Icon sees more, no, Mr. No, it's, it's, he's a, is a collector of the Tessars, good to see. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, we have a we have a lot of people there, and it, it's funny. Uh, and I'll tell anecdotes from the field as well. I know we're a little over time, but you're starting to see that come back. People really want to go back into the historic lenses and and start to collect and use them as well. It's an interesting, it's an interesting turnabout um, in photography and cinematography. We, you even see our new lines of lenses starting to. Uh, mimic some of the things that were caused in the older lenses from the mm -hmm. way the lenses were made with the, the new Supreme Prime. Um, and the radiance, yeah. Yeah, and the radiance causing that, that sunburst radiance in the lenses. So we're starting to, to create looks that we used to have years ago. It's quite wonderful. When I've always said that about the Otis versus the Milvis, that the Milvis is very sharp, very correct, and the Otis has more of a signature <laughs> style. So I it think does we're... That. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll, and I make I make Tony raise his eyebrows every time we'll, I say that. We'll we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll have heated conversations about those differences uh, at some point, I'm sure. But uh, no, you're absolutely right. Every lens family certainly has a difference to it. Um, I think we ha we had a question about uh, budget 50 millimeter lens. Um, I, I would say look at if you're a Sony shooter, look at the bodice lenses. Those are in, yeah. more in line with budget. And if you're a Nikon or a Canon shooter, look at the Milvis lenses because basically they they took all of the excellent things and all of the um, the Zeiss lenses, but they they made it more economical without really um, taking away a whole lot of the, the quality. So I think the Milvis is a great right. budget line of lenses. Especially if you you know the the 514 is a little higher price, but the 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 50 macro is is probably going to be more budget. And certainly we all love the Bodice 40. You know it's um. It's oh, I'm lens. I've got the Bodice 40 on my my camera up I, here I right now. Well. I know. I, <laughs> I, I couldn't I, live without my Bodice 40. If I told you you're not getting that back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dr. Wimmer, I'm I'm really happy that you were able to join us today, and uh, and I know we've we've kept you a little over time here, but thank you so much. Um, certainly, we'd love to welcome you back any other time uh, as well, because uh, there there's so much in the company history that we didn't even get to, um, and I'm 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 excited that we've had this opportunity to to be with you. Um, so thank you very much uh, for 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 attending today, um, and Tracy as well. I'm I'm afraid to go to the next screen because it's all going to be messed up. We have apologize we lost uh, uh zeiss ambassador kenneth he had a technical difficulty um but we do want to thank him for being here as well and tracy as always thanks for being my partner here on uh, zeiss conversations so and thanks to you everybody out there uh, uh, an excellent conversation today 
if you want us to continue on in some of these kind of historical or off the photography beaten path conversations, please do let us know. Um, you can always get me, um, you can always get Tracy, um, or you can just leave us comments on this video. Thank you very much for waking up and starting your day with us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again